Youth Action Program started in 1978 with the idea that all young people dream of creating a better society for themselves and for their families. They lack only the skills and the opportunity to realize them. YAP provides the adult support to develop those skills. Now YAP's model programs are inspiring East Harlem and their results are affecting the entire New York community. And in the process, the young people are transforming their own lives. At first, I didn't know what really YAP was. I just thought it was a job training, on the job training. And you just get your training after your year, and you just go and find yourself a job. But then, as I deeply got into YAP and started knowing people and how caring they was, it wasn't like they were just in for the money. They were, they were in it because they cared. William Torres is a youth action construction trainer, building permanent housing for homeless people. The job is supervised by professional trainers. In 1978, some teenagers wanted to reconstruct a building. One of them, Shantae Jones, teamed up with her former East Harlem black school teacher, Dorothy Stoneman. Together, they founded YAP. I remember starting off on a building on 107th Street between, I think it was Park and Lexington. There was a group of us that used to go down there and we wanted to clean out a building to, to make a home away from home or whatever. I don't even think there was an idea then as to what the building would be. Building on its pioneering construction concept, YAP organized the Coalition for $20 million, with a hundred agencies joining. As a direct result, the city has allocated $45 million for job training and placement, nine more buildings are being renovated on YAP's model, and 15,000 at-risk youths have gotten jobs. This project, uh, we really got it funded in large part by the own lobbying work that we did uh, at the Coalition $20 million, so we could get youth trainees to renovate buildings, get paid, uh, at the minimum wage while they get job training, have trainers on the site so that they can, can uh, provide the construction backup. And by having that combination and the state coming in with its homeless housing assistance program, putting up the construction funds, we have a building. We changed the world the way the young people decided it ought to be done with adults and young people working as partners. We get the partnership by reversing the power relationships so that the young people are in charge Many YAP programs are given national notice. CBS News cites YAP's problem-solving reputation. Bruce Morton found a promising New York program financed by city and private funds. Its message, in a territory ruled by street smarts, is it's smarter to get off the streets when you're growing up poor. Do you know exactly what this job entails and what you'll be doing? If there's one thing I can say about myself is that I'm an awfully quick learner. Askia Bing and his friends, teenagers, are interviewing Alan Martin job applicants, grown-up. This is a place where grown-ups pay attention to what young people think. Or well, listen to Nancy rehearsing what she will say at the city budget hearing. My whole family has been involved in drugs, crime, homelessness. I mean, you name it, and it's happened. It's, it's no good. For some 300 young people, youth action is an alternative to the street where you need four eyes. Where would they be without it? Maria started as a trainee. She now lives in an apartment she helped rebuild and works at YAP. First, how I got involved was um, living in their transitional housing for a year and meeting Dorothy Stoneman and David Calvert. Um, so you, they're like really unique, they're really something special. And um, at that period of time, I was going through a lot of feelings and emotions and um, I needed help but I, I needed like guidance and stuff. I needed to know I had a purpose in life. I met Maria on the steps of City Hall when we were holding a vigil to get the City Council to put more money in youth employment. And she's like many other young people who suffered from various kinds of neglect and mistreatment but always took the best 
out of every situation that she could. And the minute there was a place where she could see that people would care about her and would teach her, she went for it. I feel that I had leadership when I was in the group home, but it wasn't constructive because no one would listen to me. And I would always rebel, and I would always have a group of girls who would always rebel with me. When I got to the youth action program, they wanted, they saw a leadership part of me. It showed me another sign where I can use the leadership to benefit me and to benefit other young people. So I felt that if I was to speak about it, you know, to let professionals know what was going on and how the young people feel and how I felt at that time that they can change a little. I first started with the Youth Action Program when I was 18 and I'm now 28 so I consider myself a graduate of the Youth Action Program. The impact that this program has had on me is enormous. It has um, taught me about um, youth empowerment, it has taught me about accountability. I serve in about 10 different community-based housing organizations which are making decisions about the future of East Harlem. East Harlem is a community that is changing. East Harlem is a neighborhood that needs more involvement from the young people. And they are involved, from caring for others to caring for their block. Youth Action Program liberates the energy and caring of young people to take responsibilities for themselves and their community, not only in East Harlem, but beyond. We can get more programs started like YAP, and everybody acting like a sister and a brother towards each other, and maybe we can all still live in East Harlem, and there won't be no more drug problems or homeless problems. To me, I think YAP's going to grow bigger because there's a lot of love and affection in the place. And, you know, sometimes you just don't want to leave, you know, and it's getting closer to when we're leaving. And, you know, it's getting sadder and sadder and everything, you know. And when we leave, you know, we ain't going to leave, leave. We're going to come back, but we're going to have better jobs. So we're just going to come back. We can't forget how we started off. What I hope to see in 10 years from now for YAP is, um, for Yap to branch out in other, in, in other communities, not just in East Harlem, but in the Lower East Side, in the Bronx, in Queens, in Brooklyn, in Staten Island. I see young people now having such a hard time finding employment, finding um, a stepping stone to enter society. And um, it's very hard for them, so I can imagine how it's going to be in 10 years if someone doesn't stick up for these young people now. The dream is coming true. In 1988, YAP started the National Youth Build Coalition. By 1990, the Youth Build Act had been introduced in Congress. Over 200 organizations in 36 states had joined the coalition. Now, with help from Youth Build USA, local groups are launching Youth Build programs all across the nation. My name is Jonathan Case. I work for the Youth Action Construction Training Program. Today there's a building opening, and basically it's, we renovate the building for homeless people and for young people. 91 people, men and women, participated in reconstructing this building, making it available for 13 families, I believe. It was vacant, it was abandoned, rubble strewn, but what is wonderful is that of the 91 who worked, 38 now have permanent private sector jobs in the housing industry. And 47 will continue working on the adjacent building. And that building will be restored so that it can be occupied as permanent housing for homeless families. I consider this a success. Let me invite everybody to follow Mike and he'll show you the ground floor rear apartment first and take you upstairs and uh, Mike's gonna train you on the site for how long? Seven months. Seven months and uh, he can answer any question anybody has. So.
Please follow the mic. Before and after shot of how to build a new when you first get into it, before all the metal studs and wooden studs are put up. And then after you finish, this is how the building end up looking. When you first start, it's nothing but jump. Yeah. <laughs> sure, I, I mean, it's a, it's a very good feeling, you know, when you see it like that, and it comes out like this and say, I did it. You're thinking it's oh, never going to finish. Man, you know. It means a lot because we just finished this building, and, you know, I'm doing it for the homeless, you know, and I feel proud that I'm doing something for people that can't really afford rent, you know. And if I didn't have it, I would like somebody to do it for me, you know. East Harlem is a community of the abandoned, buildings left to decay, the homeless left to scavenge, youth who have left school and stand idle. But on this block, a small program called Youth Build is working to change all that. Here and on similar blocks in a dozen other cities, Youth Build is transforming neglected buildings into attractive low-cost housing, and in the process, transforming lives. Those doing the construction are young dropouts, like Hector Merced. He left school at 17. He is now 24. It hit me one day that I'm on a road to nowhere, because I would fill out a job application, and there would be nothing on it as far as skills and education. Youth Build is helping him get both skills and education in nine months. Trainees divide their time between study and construction work on a tenement building. Start right here. Experienced supervisors teach trainees basic woodworking, insulation, masonry. What was your skill level when you started out? Flat. <laughs> Flat. Didn't know nothing. nothing and now? Now, <laughs> seeing is believing. <laughs> Every other week, they put down their hard hats and go to a special youth build school to prepare for their high school equivalency diploma, their GED. The span of the building is 20 feet. The emphasis is on applying what is learned. This number is called the hypotenuse. At this youth build site in Boston, trainees use the Pythagorean theorem to measure and construct a rafter. There is an incredible need for young people to work on something of value to the community, and that need was so obvious and pressing that we made it happen. Dorothy Stoneman is a longtime community activist. She started youth build in East Harlem in 1978. It now trains about 300 young people a year in 12 sites around the country. Most are funded locally by city governments and private donations. Trainees pay nothing. In fact, Youth Build pays them minimum wage for their construction work. The cost, between $12,000 and $20,000 per trainee. If you invest $12,000 to $20,000 in a person, they're going to make a productive contribution. They're going to pay taxes. They're going to support their families. They're going to support their children. Youth Build graduate Kevin Barr now makes $9 an hour, enough to support his family of four. The program helped him get the work experience and GED required for his full-time job with a major contractor. I don't think I would be here if it wasn't for you, Bill. Where would you be? Probably still out looking for a job, the way things are today. With jobs and prospects so scarce, Youth Build is overwhelmed with applications. Blow this out. The New York program has room for 50 new trainees. Already, more than 500 young dropouts have applied. There's a lot of us who's trying to make something out of ourselves. You guys got to give us a chance, and we'll, we, can, we can prove to you that we are worth your attention. The Youth Build program has won the attention of Congress. There is bipartisan support for a bill that would give the program $120 million in federal money over the next two years. That would fund more trainees in more cities. But Youth Build's founder says the program will still be a tiny point of light where a beacon is what's needed. I would employ all the unemployed people to rebuild all the abandoned housing to house all the homeless people. And that should be national policy. It isn't. Yet Hector Merced says even a small victory is important if it's yours. Just look, he says, at what is happening at his construction site. It's nothing right now. It's all messed up and everything. And soon it'll be something beautiful. I figure that's like me. Pretty soon I'll be like that building, brand new and, and you know, usable. Now that's perfect. Beth Nissen, ABC News, East Harlem, New York. It's the story of a longtime community activist, Dorothy Stoneman, who felt back in 1978 that someone needed to pay attention to young people. So I began to ask young people, 
what would you do if adults would back you up? What do you like about growing up in East Harlem? What don't you like? What would you like to change? And what would you put all your energy into if, if I would put all my energy into backing you up? And over and over again, people said, I rebuild the housing. I built that building, I built that building. I get the addicts out of there. I make housing for the grandmothers and the homeless people who need housing. Just give me the tools. Dorothy Stoneman got them the tools and scratched up some money for construction materials. Young volunteers spent nearly five years rehabilitating this one building. Today, the Youth Action Project, also called the Youth Build Coalition, has 226 member organizations in 37 states. But the busiest site is here in East Harlem. What did this place look like when you started? A cadem building with holes in the walls and holes in the floor. And we had to work all around that night, tearing the walls down, taking out the floors, and putting down plywood so you can walk over without hurting yourself. At first, they didn't have nothing. But well, now they got shape, and now we're ready to put on the finish and stuff, which is the clothing, and people be able to live in it. So this is your work down here? Yeah, down here, up on the roof, copings, um, lentils, putting up window lentils, and everything. These four high school dropouts who are about to complete the 11-month training program are typical Youth Build members, according to Stoneman. It's almost like an infinite number of young people who you put an ad in the newspaper, two weeks, 300 young people come in. Young people who've been on the streets who somebody has called a loser. They don't want to be losers. They may have internalized that message. But if they see a way out of that, they'll try to open that door and go down that road. And if, that, if once they open the door, People care about them, respect them, engage them, their hearts and their minds in an endeavor which seems to them to be worthwhile and seems to them to lead to a future. They'll stick with it. This is a family right here. Yeah. He, my supervisor, what I mean a family is that we all get along, we all have this communication. Um, if one needs something, we, we help each other out. If one is hungry, we feed each other like that. We put our money together. You know, he taught us like that. You know, it's not only that he taught us the trade. He teaches us like that, too. Love and respect. Yeah, and respect one another. Love, that's, you know, really brings things together, you know. And um, respect, that comes right along with it. And you can depend on one another. Like, yeah. if I, well, I need a mix going. He'll do it. Won't yeah. be no argument going on. Yeah. That's what makes the. That's what makes us so close. A kind of a team. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a, a lot of teamwork. That's what gets the job done, and the job, and, and everybody feel good about it. If you don't have team participation, you can forget about it. Young people will tell you, I don't trust anybody. I don't trust my friends. Coming to trust people is one of the primary things you have to build into a program. And when the young people trust each other and trust the adults, then they can begin to take a different kind of responsibility for planning and hoping and, and living the way they'd like to. This is 11 Heckler Street in Dorchester. Till a short time ago, this building was populated by drug addicts who sold drugs, got high, and generally made lousy neighbors. Today, it's a construction site, and in a sense, a classroom. See, all 30 contractors inside are the participants in a new program called Youth Build Boston. Now, before they started the program, none of these people had finished high school or had any formal construction training. Today, half the group attends class during the week, learning math, science, and history of the construction trades, while the other half works here. Then next week, they switch, as they will every week, until this one-year program is complete. But let's go inside and meet some of the members. How you doing? Well, this building may not look like much now. On the other hand, there aren't any drugs being sold here anymore either. And when they're all through, threes will be wild. Three separate three-bedroom apartments on these three floors. Let's go inside right now. And there are a couple of guys here working on the project who were involved in opening up this house and seeing what it looked like when they first started the project. How you doing? This is uh, David and uh, Keith. Now, you guys were actually uh, saw some of the building when it was first opened up, right? Yeah. Who's first here, actually, first in? I was. You were, Keith. Yeah. Yeah? What, uh, uh, what kind of, what did you see when you first came in? Well, I came in through the basement window, and downstairs there's like a little room. There's a lot of drug paraphernalia down there. And Crack vials and yeah, stuff? Yeah, old mattresses and pipes and all yeah. kind of drug stuff, yeah. Yeah. 
Now, you, uh, the, um, there were people, David, I understand, that were still here, right? Some of the dealers and so forth. When you guys came in, how did they uh, take to this project getting started? Well, when I first came here, it's like they confronted us. They started messing with, like, the dumpster, the hot tools, started throwing things in the street, kind of like a distraction. So I, I seen what they were getting ready to do, so I said, it's best for me to set the tone early. And it's like I had to go over and let them know that while we're working here, we're not going to be allowing them to harass the people working for yeah. us. And so it's like they said, uh, this is our house. And it's like, you know, we're going to run you all out of here or we're going to uh, burn it down. I said, well, you know, if this is your house, I told them we're at the wrong house. Well, either they ain't taking care of their business. So they kind of looked at us like, well, we're going to keep harassing you. So I said, well, as long as you're going to harass us, we're going to harass you. So don't even plan on, you know, threatening us. Yeah. And after they got that, the message. They got the message because after that, they didn't bother us anymore. They yeah. might they might keep filling the dumpster out when we go home, but that's about it. Yeah. And uh, since then, we ain't had no too much trouble. And yeah. since we've been building this building up, they're more or less looking at it and saying, wow, them guys are really doing something positive. And they're kind of backing off because now they go by and they say hi to that's everybody amazing. working here. So that's real good. You get good. that feeling, Keith, working on this, that some of the dealers who were here actually might be impressed by what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. yeah, it must feel good. Yeah, they like it, I guess. What? Starting to. Just lead me on in here. Okay, okay, come on in. Talk to some of the other guys. This effort. A couple of them are over here right now. Jackie Gelb is the executive director of Youth Build, and David Lopes is the uh, construction manager here. Now, David, uh, this is something new for you, kind of. I know you've been in the construction business a while, but here you're kind of uh, playing the role of teacher, too. How's that been? That's true. It's It's been a very interesting experience uh, in uh, trying to... Um, mesh the two together teacher and and also try to get the job done in in a some semblance of time that makes sense now i know that you feel the pressure of getting the job done and i've also noticed you have amazing patience because sometimes it must be almost uh, hard to restrain yourself from grabbing a hammer and nail there and and doing it yourself but yeah, i see you manage to sort of stand back and, yeah. and tell them what they should do and let them do it and that's the only way they're going to learn properly is by repetitively doing things over and over again even if it means putting it in then taking it down again if i do it for them it's, that's not going to you know benefit them so uh i just let them do it and just a good feeling for you to see this happening yeah I think it them. is a good feeling yeah. to see yeah. these young people you know picking up a, a trade and making something useful out of themselves and getting a house built at the same time and getting a house built yeah. at the same time yeah. which brings me to jackie uh now who benefits from this program and obviously we're not talking money here what are some of the who, who really profits and what are the kinds of human profits well i think obviously the trainees get a lot out of it otherwise they wouldn't be here but i think right. it goes way beyond that um the neighborhoods the immediate neighbors benefit they're really glad they're very happy that the house is being built the people that are going to be moving in here are low-income families that are looking for affordable housing which is very difficult to find in boston and so that's another contribution and then all i think in a lot of ways these young people are role models for other young people in the area and they're and they're being watched by a lot of young people to see what you know oh we can yeah. be doing something different and then the city's watching and saying and learning and saying are if we offered another opportunity for some of these young people out on the streets maybe we wouldn't have the kind of troubles we're having are now. you getting calls is there a waiting list oh, for kids who want to get involved in we this? get calls every single day we turn down that's good close to 200 people well it's good and it's bad we only have room for 30 because of the because we're not funded for more right will there now. be other starts other rehab projects we're going to do another one when this is finished and we'll be taking 30 more people next september but really what's needed is other programs like this that for thousands of young people out there that want to make a difference in the community and want to improve their lives and just need a chance i think that's the thing both the fact that the neighbors say it's it does something for the neighborhood and it seems like you give these kids a chance they're running with it everybody wins yeah you know and it's, right. it's we just need to do more of it all right jackie good luck thanks good program. It's no life in using drugs and hanging out on the streets and just going nowhere, doing nothing with your life. It's nothing out there. It's nothing out there, you know. And I was there at one point in time, and I thank God that I'm not today. Dorothy Fleming once sold drugs, spent time in jail, and lived on welfare. Today, she works full-time and has been awarded two college scholarships. Dorothy says she owes it all to a program called Youth Build. Give me another 16. Worst enemies 
Youth Build is an intensive one-year program in which unemployed young men and women earn their high school equivalency diploma and learn construction skills while renovating abandoned buildings. It's a challenging program, rebuilding neighborhoods and rebuilding lives. Help me stay out of trouble. I feel like I'm as a person. I've met a lot, a lot of new friends and things like that. Take care of business. I like that. Through life, I've been getting, you know, everybody's been letting me slide, you know, a lot of programs, but this, you know, you have to hold your ground. Half of the Youth Build program takes place on a job site, half in the classroom. You have to be able to graphically show the owner and the contractor how each of the, the walls are built, how it's going to look. Youth Build started just three years ago, but already it's become a national model, a program replicated in 13 other cities. Its success is due in part to people like Kevin DePina, a professional architect and a volunteer teacher. And I think there are more people who would be able to, who would step out to do this if it wasn't if the young people in the community were not always characterized as being villains and hoodlums and stuff like that, because a lot of them aren't. They just need some direction. We're using the same anchor bolts. Same anchor bolts, yeah. And um, we're going to go into the five locations right here. Youth Bill isn't just about drawing lines or hammering nails. This program is about building self-esteem and allowing young people to develop leadership skills and realize their potential. I want to get in some type of, of a career to where I can, you know, I build my own house or be settled down when I'm 40, something like that. I don't want to just work hard all my life and not accomplish anything. I want to have something back to look on. Each year, more than 400 young people apply to the Youth Build program, but there's room for only 40 students. Of those who graduate, 80% land a job or go on to college. Dorothy Fleming is one of those who has done both, and for her, there is no turning back. Youth Bill has offered me so much and has led me in the right directions. It's a feeling I can't explain. It's like, it's real overwhelming. I'm so proud of myself. I've never been this proud of myself in my entire life. I'm Liz Walker for WBZ News 4. John James, a trainee who went through the program during its second cycle, will be recounting some of his experiences. I didn't know the pairs really around me, so I don't know, you know, we were work, working around tools and stuff like that, so, you know, I really didn't know. My, that's why I always like to work by myself, because, you know, I don't like too many people working around me. So, you know, I, I, I see how the staff, the informers worked out with the pairs, you know, how to hand, you know, handle your tools and stuff like that, so. And I got the money with my, you know, my pairs around, because I was, at first I was quiet when I first came into the program. Until I got to know everybody in there. The most important thing that worked out in youth field was the counseling. Because I had a bad attitude. I blow up and explode. Any, every little thing that happens, I, I explode. I couldn't talk to a person face to face without screaming and yelling. And it seemed like they would not listen to me and it gets me more mad. So um, I gave them a counselor. Wesley did a good job, you know, to calm me down, you know, and tell me. To, to speak to somebody clearly so they can hear you and understand you. And um, that worked out for here in youth building and plus outside. Wes was talking, you know, streetwise. He knew how to come to me. I mean, because I guess he experienced the same thing. So he knew how to, you know, he got my attention. Because at first I was like, well, nobody can tell me what to do, you know? But, uh, you know, he had, we had these little rap sessions that everybody sits around and, and talk to each other. So we heard, we heard everybody out. And then the answer that Wes was giving up was, was pretty good. And you know, then I you know, pulled him to the side and we sat down and talked to each other. And then you know, he, the advice that he was giving me was you know, just telling me you know, to relax. You know, look around at home before, I mean, take care of your problems at home before you come here and take care of, you know, cause I would take, when I had problems at home, I used to come here and take it out on the people around me out here. When John came in the program, you know, he seemed to be doing well until um, I started seeing his lack of confidence and how he was highly critical <laughs> about other things, you know. And I used to ask him in sessions why he was like that, you know, just trying to fill him out. Me and him established a good relationship, too, because he see that I was straightforward with him and I was honest with him, you know. And I even revealed some things to him that uh, really helped him, you know, around my own self-esteem, how I dealt with it, and how I felt with myself, the whole thing. So he could really relate. 
So we established that and I started really helping him and pushing him to a point that, you know, John, he started putting this stuff out in, 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 a, in a group rap, group uh, discussion, you know, so he wasn't afraid and got feedback from his peers, you know. Uh, so that was good for him. It was really good for him to be open, which really was no problem because, you know, you hear John a couple blocks away. <laughs> you know, that's the type of person he was, so. I felt that I was slipping away. I was slipping away from the youth of getting back into the streets, and it was like, I had problems in the process of, you know, the girls, and I had problems with them. You know, missing days, going out of town. Couldn't come back, you know, to school on time, and I was being late. Attitude started coming back, and uh, it was that I was having problems with her and bringing it into youth field. Going back in the streets, you know, hanging out so late that I couldn't get up in the morning to come into you, you know, and uh, but they caught me. They they came up to me. They caught me real quick. <laughs> you know, they, they they actually caught me. I mean, they pulled me out of um, the work site one day, and they was like, "We have to talk to you." We had a um, staff member that was doing a job placement, you know, um, so to be interviewed. She's going to try to get you a job, you know, get intervention with him. You know, let him know that, hey, uh, you know, you, you won't be qualified for this and for that, you know, if you don't, you know, sh you know, shape up. Western Laura came and picked me up and they picked me up from the website, brought me here, and then y'all had a big meeting. It was There's a whole group of us. Yeah, in there. All of y'all. And everybody T -T -T made it out. Teach, um, Kareem. Everybody came in there, and then y'all just sat me down, you know, and looked like, you know, with his big dunks in his hat, you know. <laughs> y'all just choked on me. That was it. Y'all just changed yeah. up on me. We told him that, uh, you know, number one, he had to be there every day. He had to, you know, there's no more this, you know, Monday holidays, what we call Monday holidays, you know. Mm -hmm. Can't make it in on Mondays because. We're sick from uh, our activities over the weekend, you know. So we had to, you know, dispense with Monday holidays. We had to, he had to realize that what he did on the weekends was affecting him in the week, and did affect what he was going, you know, what he was going to be able to do, um, and had to bring that home to him in a way that he heard it. Uh, in some of the cases where we sit down, and one of the cases with John when we sat down. It was myself and a couple of other men where we brought it home very clearly <coughs> and very uh, uh, succinctly where, you know, no words were minced about what had to be done. That's when we, when we first started our uh, experiments, I will say, with interventions, with group interventions. Group being that a number of uh, staff people would get together and, and confront the young person in question or the person who was having uh, difficulties or problems uh, with their issues and throw them on the table and basically it's kind of like uh, it's like stripping all the uh, the coverings off and you and you're in a state of where you are completely open and you've got to deal because it's not like you can hide anything anymore and you got to say yeah you know unless you know unless you want to just be in, um, in total denial you you have no option but to you say, confront the issues that are being put down and they say, yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. And, 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 okay. And then we'd say, well, now that we've got that out there, okay, we are not passing judgment on you to say you're a bad person. We're saying for you to be able to succeed in life, you got to change these behaviors. And if you don't, then we're going to lose you and you're going to lose yourself because you won't be able to stay here with those bad behaviors. Okay, so you have a choice. Do you want to do you want to change, or do you want to continue with this and just go nowhere in life? You know what the what the other way is because you see it around you. See, you see that it's a dead end street. It's going nowhere. It leads to death. It leads to incarceration. It leads to um, uh, addiction and all that. So which way do you want to go? And 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 basically the person has to make a choice. And John decided to make the choice that he did not want to go that way, and he was going to continue to try. And, and improve, uh, you know, the, his position in life and, and do some of the things that he needed to do. The thing that was telling me, you know, to do and stuff like that, I mean, when I seen it working, and you know, I felt good about it, so I kept up with it. I mean, 
to, that's, when I see something that's working, I mean, and it's working right for me and I feel good about it, I'm, I'm gonna try to keep going that way. You know, and um, the way, you know, and the way they put it too, you know, you out of here, you know, and I didn't want to leave, you know, I liked it. And, you know, you keep slacking up, you're out of here. You know, went home and think about it, like, oh, I'm, up, I'm about to get kicked out, so I got to, you know, in my mind, like, I'm being threatened. They think I can't make it. They, they tell me I can't, they, the way they put it, it seemed like I can't, I can't make it, but I can prove to them that I can make it. So that puts myself, you know, and that's why I came back. You know, after intervention, you really start shaping up because uh, a lot of opportunities was coming through Youth Bill that, uh, in a sense, when he did work, he worked. But uh, and he would have been qualified if it wasn't for his inconsistencies, but he wasn't at this time, you know. He had to prove himself, establish that with us again, so that's what he had to deal with. And so he started picking up his motivation and started being consistent for a little while. Uh, he still had a hard time with that GD. I always thought I'd never pass a test in GD. You know, I was like, give me a job. I don't need a GD. I don't, and um, only thing right now is getting to me about the GD. I see jobs flying in my face. GD, you need it. You need it. And, I, and I'm, I'm passing the jobs up. But I ask him, well, why he do such and why is his behavior is such as this in the classroom? You know, especially when it comes to tests and things like that. So right then I connected to uh, his inability or his feelings toward um, taking tests or taking his GED and so forth, you know, or his inconfidence he had. And when it, when it really broke the barriers with him, I found out that, you know, he, he revealed to me that his father used to be highly critical to him, you know, which made him feel, though, he ain't gonna never do that, never be nothing. You know, so in trying to encourage him and build his self-esteem up and his confidence, you know, in that he can succeed, you know, he would just sabotage stuff or dump his feelings or be highly critical to the program, y'all this and that, you know, so he had this dependent attitude, like you supposed to give me, you know. So in dealing with him around, I just straight out confronted him with it, you know. Oh, you such a man, you know, deal with this test. Wes gave me confidence in GD. He said, you know, just go out there and say you're gonna get it. You're gonna get it. So when he told me that and I took my last three GED test, two, no, two of them. I passed them, and, but I didn't have that confidence when I took the other first three, so I failed those. Like, um, now I have the confidence. I'm signing up tomorrow, you know, this time I'm gonna have the confidence, you know. I'm gonna...